everyone to the July 2021 meeting of the Moonton uh, Peninsula Astronomical Society and we're all in lockdown once again due to COVID-19 uh, outbreak in uh, the state. Highlight of uh, the previous month has been the competition uh, to uh, try and reach uh, space or near to space by the two uh, billionaires uh, Sir Richard uh, Branson of uh, Virgin, Virgin Galactic, uh, Virgin Galactic fame, and uh, Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon uh, fame. Uh, as it turned out, Richard Branson uh, uh, beat him in his uh, launch uh, aboard the uh, Unity 22 craft, which was um, flown up uh, to a high altitude uh, beneath uh, an aircraft and then uh, let go and uh, use rocket uh, propulsion from that point forward to get him up uh, at least near to space. Um, he achieved an altitude of uh, 85 uh, kilometres high, which is slightly shy of the 100 kilometres that uh, is generally recognised as being the point where uh, outer space begins. Of course, uh, it's not um, clearly defined as such. Uh, the 100 kilometre height or Kármán line was named after Theodore von uh, Kármán and is uh, taken as that point that uh, is generally uh, thought that uh, winged aircraft are unable to actually gain any lift and hence fly uh, no matter how far they actually go because of the uh, thinness of the atmosphere at that height and so from that height onwards you actually need rocket propulsion to uh, successfully move. Um, the other one uh, going up, aside from uh, Richard Branson, uh, was uh, nine days later uh, by uh, Jeff Bezos in um, the uh, Blue Origin uh, New Shepard craft. And uh, he went up with uh, an 82-year-old uh, pilot and um, at one stage uh, a potential astronaut trainee, uh, Wally Funk, and an 18-year-old Oliver Damon as well and that one was uh, sent up in uh, something looking a little bit more like a conventional rocket rather than on uh, an aircraft. Um, Bezos actually got up to 107 kilometres high so he um, uh, certainly achieved uh, going over the Kármán line and hence um, could put his hand on his heart and say that uh, he was uh, in space. Uh, and I believe um, uh, the uh, uh, the waiting uh, list to go up uh, from people who've already booked is about 600 people, and uh, they've uh, each um, so so far um, 
pledged a quarter of a million dollars to just be able to uh, fly up for a few moments in uh, space. So in the case of Branson, who got there first on the um, 11th of July, um, they uh, achieved Mach 3 as the uh, um, fastest speed and uh, in the time that it took them to actually fly up to altitude and then boost into um, uh, suborbital levels. Uh, it was about an hour end to end but it only uh, achieved a couple of minutes of weightlessness as they were coming back in. On the other hand uh, Bezos in the uh, rocket type per craft um, was uh, 11 minutes uh, end to end from the time when it launched to the time when it uh, uh, touched down and uh, achieved um, most of that time uh, actually uh, weightless apart from a couple of minutes getting up and obviously uh, gliding back uh, down again. Uh, first of all welcome to any new members of uh, the society. Uh, it's uh, probably a little unfortunate that uh, we can't get to meet you face to face but hopefully we'll do so soon at the Briars as soon as we're able to uh, get back and uh, fingers crossed that will be um, in August in some form uh, potentially uh, with uh, diminished attendance or if uh, in worst case it will be like this uh, pre-recorded. Um, first of all I'll go through as usual the events that uh, have happened in the past and, uh, and the upcoming months and then uh, we'll go into the main uh, talk uh, which will be um, by Nobel Laureate uh, Professor Sir Paul Nurse uh, when he gave a talk at the Royal Institution in uh, London a few years ago. Now he's uh, now retired but he uh, was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for his um, uh, research into life and cells and how cells actually uh, grow and divide so uh, attempts to answer the question uh, what is life. Uh, that is particularly relevant, uh, particularly with the American rover um, currently on Mars, as uh, one of its primary mission objectives is to try and search for evidence of life on the planet, but precisely what actually is life. Following that we have uh, Sky for the Month that's been kindly put together by uh, Mark, as, uh, as usual, and uh, that goes through uh, what's uh, visible in the night sky over the uh, coming uh, weeks, uh, certainly during uh, July. After that we'll uh, go into some uh, science uh, videos uh, along uh, a couple of themes, one along uh, um, the theme of life and also about the uh, creation of uh, the moon um, and indeed uh, the uh, earth as we know it today after the collision with the, uh, uh, the planet Thea which uh, was uh, believed to have collided with the earth when the earth uh, was about half a billion years old. And fortunately for us it was um, not a direct hit, it was more a, a glancing blow and we'll see a lot more of that uh, in some of these videos uh, that um, uh, will uh, we'll be shown uh, shortly. Uh, it will also introduce the concept of uh, synestias that were put forward as a potential um, other explanation for lunar formation from um, the Earth and uh, this is a, a very interesting theory whereby uh, it doesn't say there wasn't a collision but rather that um, uh, a collision was uh, sufficient to actually turn the earth uh, moon system effectively gaseous um, uh, at least for a short period of time until it uh, condensed down into something that was able to um, effectively form a magma. And uh, at the end we'll uh, close with uh, looking at the timeline of uh, evolution from the earliest point on earth uh, right up to um, current uh, human evolution. And uh, this one comes from the uh, Smithsonian Institution and uh, is a, a good summary based on the total knowledge that um, we have of uh, life from the fossil record uh, to date. So uh, well worth uh, looking at that. Now before I look at uh, the recent events we'll start off with um, a simulation here from Japanese researchers uh, two years ago in Nature Geoscience, so a very prestigious uh, science journal and uh, they attempted to answer some of um, the uh, uh, potential issues with the uh, Thea and Proto-Earth uh, collision uh, and one of the uh, issues has been that um, recent uh, simulations have shown that the moon should predominantly have been made of um, mostly the stuff that Thea was uh, made from. Uh, however the lunar rocks that came back from um, the Apollo missions to the moon uh, demonstrated conclusively that the moon is very very similar to the earth, in fact uh, identical to the earth in uh, composition. And um, what these two Japanese researchers have done is uh, used, um, again, computer simulation 
but uh, attempt to explain how uh, that could come about. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, if the Earth was actually still molten at the time of the impact, so in other words, uh, they're saying uh, when the Earth was half a billion years old, it uh, still hadn't uh, started to cool down in its crust and, st and still was uh, very, very uh, molten. So in other words, uh, the Earth was effectively a large um, magma ocean and the collision occurred with Earth and then uh, flung some of that off. And this simulation indeed shows that uh, the composition of the Moon should be made from that of Earth, um, as opposed to uh, mostly that uh, of uh, Thea. And indeed the Moon itself doesn't have uh, an iron core at its centre like uh, the Earth does. So we'll begin first of all with uh, that, um, the simulation that, uh, that they show, so you can actually see the Earth coming and then we'll move on to uh, the recent events of the month. Right, so recent happenings uh, of uh, the last month uh, in the society. Uh, on the 21st of June, we were due to have our second uh, Year 10 work experience student. Uh, this particular one was uh, coming from uh, Mount Erin Secondary in uh, Frankston, but unfortunately, at the very last moment, we were all dragged into a COVID lockdown, so that had to be uh, called off. That was called off. Uh, unsurprisingly uh, by the school so that means two out of two um, year 10 students we've had this year have uh, had to be cancelled for the exactly the same reason. On the 23rd of June committee met uh, via Zoom meetings and um, the primary things for discussion were uh, the uh, geodesic dome that the Shire was going to put uh, outside the front of our observatory and indeed uh, I believe uh, it looks like they're well and truly advanced uh, to uh, doing that. Um, so the next time you come up to the Briars, there may indeed be a six metre um, hemispherical dome sitting out uh, the uh, front of the society's um, site, uh, which indeed may look, it may, uh, look um, quite futuristic and catch people's attention if uh, nothing else. Um, it will probably look quite 
quite nice while it's brand new, but who knows what it will look like uh, after many years of uh, weathering. And the other uh, um, topic that uh, took a lot of uh, time at uh, committee was uh, going through the constitution for uh, updates. Um, many of these updates are fairly cosmetic in nature, and so it's not been worth our while to actually make them. Uh, in the past, given that there's always a cost involved with updating the constitution and uh, that uh, wouldn't have warranted it. But uh, this time there have been a couple of issues occur in uh, other societies and this attempts to make changes to um, the constitution so as to avoid their learnings of um, uh, what happened in their societies due to uh, very similar sort of wordings or uh, absence of wordings. A few days later, on the 30th of June, uh, Society visited uh, Camp Manning uh, again in um, uh, Mornington, or close to the Mornington Mount Eliza uh, boundary. Um, YMCA from Whittlesea, we had about uh, 37 people there. Unfortunately, it was uh, completely clouded. Um, it wasn't initially, but uh, the cloud came over very, very quickly uh, during the evening. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, they got to um, hear the talk and ask uh, lots and lots of questions, uh, but they just didn't get to see the night sky, unfortunately. A couple of days later, on the 2nd of July, a Friday, we had a public night at uh, the Briars, where Manfred uh, Berger gave um, his uh, next talk to the society, a next solar system talk. Um, we were at uh, 50 people, which was pretty much the COVID uh, density limit capacity that were allowed in the auditorium under the uh, one person per two square metre rule. And alas, that was also 100% uh, cloudy. And from memory, I think it was a little bit uh, drizzly as well. Uh, the next night, the 3rd of July, which was a Saturday, we had a, uh, a second public night uh, put on, primarily because we um, couldn't fit as many people in uh, with the uh, COVID limitations as we have been able to in uh, previous years, uh, pre-pandemic. And this one, uh, Trevor Hand gave uh, a talk this time, and uh, there were 53 in attendance and 99% uh, clouds, so pretty much uh, the same outcome as uh, the uh, Friday evening. Right, coming up soon, we've got uh, a members working bee uh, at the Briars uh, that's scheduled for the 24th of July, but due to uh, COVID lockdown, that uh, simply is not going to occur. So that will be uh, postponed to uh, a future month, hopefully uh, in uh, August. A few days later on the 28th will be the next uh, committee meeting at 7.30pm. Uh, members uh, who are financial are welcome to uh, dial in and uh, listen and observe to that uh, if they wish. Um, and that will be uh, by uh, Zoom rather than uh, in person. On the 30th of uh, July, we're scheduled to have a uh, our quarterly Scouts, Cubs and uh, Girl Guides Night uh, at the Briars. At this stage, we have 26 uh, booked from a group uh, in Langwarren and uh, Manfred uh, Berger is uh, due to uh, give a talk there and it's fingers crossed that um, that's uh, not going to be uh, cancelled by uh, COVID restrictions at the time. But uh, as of the uh, time of uh, recording this, uh, it's uh, full steam ahead. Uh, a few days later on the 5th of August, we're back out to uh, Merrick's camp in uh, Merrick's for a visiting uh, group of year 10s from uh, up north about uh, 50 of them, and I'll be uh, speaking at that uh, particular meeting, all being well. The next night is our public night at the Briars, which is a Friday night, the regular one, at uh, 8 o'clock, and Trevor's given the talk for that one, and we are currently booked out uh, for that one. The next night, the 7th of August, which being a Saturday night, uh, is also another public night at the Briars, and I believe that one is um, also booked out as of uh, tonight and uh, the talk uh, I think is being given by uh, Guido Tack uh, this um, particular time. Again, all being well with uh, lockdown on uh, the evening. A few days later, 10th of August, we're down in Frankston for the Baden-Powell Scouts and uh, Cubs. We've uh, visited them uh, a few times over the years at their uh, um, Scout Hall in uh, Baden-Powell Drive in Frankston and we're anticipating 50 uh, present there for that uh, particular um, uh, talk and telescopes. The next night we have another scout night but this time back at the Briars on the 11th of August and we're anticipating again capacity on that one to uh, the COVID limitations so 50 and uh, Catherine McCoy is uh, giving her talk uh, about the solar system uh, to them. Next uh, meeting of the Society in August is on the 18th of uh, August and that uh, should be held at the Briars, all being well. 
and uh, we've got a visiting speaker this time, retired recently from the Bureau of Meteorology. It's uh, Dr. Robert Coleman, who's um, who headed up uh, the uh, climate science uh, section of uh, the Bureau and uh, coming to uh, come and talk to us about uh, climate change. So that will prove to be a very um, interesting talk. He was actually scheduled last year during Science Week as well. Um, but unfortunately, COVID restrictions at the time uh, caused that to be cancelled. And uh, fingers crossed that this year at uh, the August event, uh, that can uh, still go ahead. Now, because of uh, the likely popularity of the uh, topic and the fact that we are limited by COVID, there will be um, bookings opened on try bookings for that one so that we uh, know precisely who's going to be there and, um, uh, and we don't exceed our limit uh, by mistake. Now, for tonight's talk, we have um, uh, Emeritus Pro uh, Professor Sir Paul Nurse, who's probably one of the most distinguished uh, uh, scientists and uh, physicists in, uh, sorry, biologists and geneticists in um, all of uh, the UK. Um, he's a associated with the Rockefeller University uh, these days, given that uh, he's now actually uh, retired and um, is uh, a very, very engaging and uh, interesting speaker. So if you're very interested to uh, uh, learn what the prerequisites of life are and what the characteristics of life of all sorts are, um, do please listen to this uh, very interesting uh, talk. So, what is life? What is life? That's going to be the question that I'm going to consider this evening. It's one of the most fundamental questions in biology. I think many would argue it is the most fundamental question in bi biology. I'm going to talk mostly about life on planet Earth, but the question also makes us think about life elsewhere in the universe, should it exist, perhaps built in different ways from that on our own planet. Before I begin, I want to stress something. Living things are extraordinary. They are completely extraordinary. They are entities that can maintain themselves, they can grow, they can organize themselves, construct themselves, reproduce into two identical copies or close to identical copies copies. They pass on their characteristics to their progeny. They are also extremely diverse. And it so happens, which is why this lecture is difficult, is that life is very difficult to define. Now, the approach I'm going to use is to examine some of the great ideas of biology, five great ideas of biology, which uh, characterize the attributes of life. I'm going to give you a little history of where those ideas came from. And then I'm going at the end or towards the end of my lecture to derive from those five great ideas some core principles with the hope of getting closer to defining what life is. I hope you noticed the careful way I said that sentence close hope of getting closer rather than actually answering the question. Now, of course, I'm not the first to ask this question. It's been wrestled with by scientists over the ages. And my first slide here was, is the first page of a very influential contribution published by Schrodinger, he of the uncertainty principle, um, a physicist who dabbled in biology in his later life and published a book, this book here, um, in 1944. It's the 75th anniversary of this book, uh, based on lectures he gave in Dublin in 1943. He was particularly concerned with how living organisms maintained order. As a physicist, he was particularly interested in the second law of thermodynamics, and he wanted to know how life could escape the decay into chaos that is, of course, enshrined 
in that particular law, and how to do it across generations. This is two quotes I've taken um, from that 1944 book, which actually is quite a good read. I, um, I still read it occasionally, and um, in fact it's on my kitchen table because of this talk at this very moment. The first there, an organism's astonishing gift of controlling a stream of order on itself and thus escaping the decay into atomic chaos. The second law, as I just said. And he's also interested in how this order displays the power of maintaining itself and producing orderly events. And this is what I'm going to be talking about um, in the rest of this um, lecture. I'm going to start it with the cell. The cell as the basic unit of life. As I said, I'm going to give a, um, some uh, background to this, some history. The cell was first observed by um, Robert Hooke, in, um, um, who he published his uh, observations in 1665. And you'll see here on the left the black and white picture of what he saw. He took a piece of cork, cut it with a razor, put it under a microscope similar to the one you see in this picture behind me, and saw lots of little boxes. I put on the right there a, a, a modern scanning EM picture. It's pretty similar, really. Not too much advanced in 350 years. What he saw there were rows of boxes. He called them cells after the Latin cella for small cubicle. And soon after him, a Dutch draper, Lowenhoek, lived in Delft, quite a humble man, made even better microscopes than, um, than Hook. And he scraped between his teeth and put it under one of his microscopes. And what did he see? He saw bacteria, the very first observations of single-celled microbial life. The charming pictures here, can you see, I think it's figure B, it, obviously they were swimming around and did a, a loop, the loop there, as you can see. Lone Hook was a bit disturbed by this because he's rather proud of his clean teeth and I think was disturbed at discovering all this life um, in between his, um, his teeth. He sent all his observations uh, to the Royal Society. There's a thousand letters there um, describing... Um, his um, observations. We don't have a reliable portrait of him, but um, he was the neighbour of um, Vermeer, the famous Delft painter. And Vermeer unusually uh, did two paintings of a scientist, a, ge a geographer and an astronomer. And I like to think this might be Lowenhoek that we're looking at here. I should say, as I am a scientist, there's not one ounce of evidence in favour <laughs> in favour of that. Now, although cells were observed uh, just before um, the beginning of the 18th century, science developed over quite a long time, um, and a couple of centuries, in fact, and eventually led to two concepts. The first concept was... Um, uh, stated here by Theodor Schwann, a German zoologist, he published in German, this is a translation here um, from 1839. We have seen that all organisms are composed essentially of like parts, namely of cells. In other words, the cell is the basic structural unit of life. Very critical. The second observation, the second concept I want you to be aware of, a few years later, another German, Rudolf Virchow, politician and scientist, founder of pathology, by the way, he stated, and it's a little different, every animal appears as a sum of vital units, living units, each of which bears in itself the complete characteristics of life. In other words, the cell is also the basic functional unit of life. All growth and development of life is in fact based on the cell, Here's a fertilized mammalian egg with the sperm bashing on the door of the, um, of the egg. And if I haven't um, inspired an interest in you yet, 
let me remind you all that you once all looked like this. <laughs> you were once all a single cell. Through growth and repeated reproduction of cells, we produce here a mammalian embryo and then eventually ourselves. Now, what do we learn by cell from, from, from this discussion about cells, about life and what it is? This is a, a, a modern um, multicolored version of cells. Well, a couple of conclusions. The first point is, as I've just said, as the basic structural and functional unit of life, it is the simplest entity which exhibits the characteristics of life. It can maintain itself, it can grow, it can self-organize, it reproduces, and it has heredity. What this means is, if we try and simplify um, the discussion, that if we can understand cells, then we're very close to understanding life, because it is the simplest entity that has the characteristics of life. And that means cells are going to figure quite a lot in this talk, but what I say about cells applies to living organisms as well, including ourselves. The second point is that the cell is bounded. It's separate from its environment. You saw that obviously with the microbial cells, the bacteria, but it's also the case for all our cells, which are all surrounded by a membrane and separate from the rest of the environment. Why is that important? It's important because it allows order to be generated within the cell, giving rise to complexity, without contravening the second law of thermodynamics. It's an isolated system which creates order um, as a consequence of further disorder in the environment. So in fact, the problems with second law of thermodynamics that physicists always worry about simply isn't an issue because of the cell as a bounded entity. Although it's a bounded entity, it has to be in communication with the environment. It's semi-permeable. The membrane is, is uh, literally semi-permeable, and it builds up within itself components that it takes from outside in its environment. Um, it produces, um, it, 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 it takes those components out, um, it takes them up a concentration gradient, it requires energy to do that. But the important point is that being isolated from the environment, complexity can arise. So we don't have to worry about the uh, problem that certainly was of great interest for um, Schrodinger. However, he said something a little more. He was interested in how that order is maintained generation after generation. And he came up with the idea that maybe there was a code script. And uh, this is another quote from um, that little book. Um, these chromosomes, uh, we kind of come to chromosomes in a moment, contain in some kind of code script. The entire pattern of the individual's future development in function is related to a code script. And he goes on to speculate that it may be what he called an aperiodic um, solid. He was trying to explain how order could persist. And he speculated that that code script underpinned the development and function of the living organism. Now, this is essentially um, the second great idea of biology I want to talk about, which is the gene as the basis of heredity. Now, this came about from work from um, the abbot of a uh, monastery in Bruno, now the Czech Republic. He uh, was a monk when he did what I'm about to describe, but then became um, the abbot. Um, he uh, was trained as a physicist, and he got very interested in doing um, crosses with plants to try and uh, understand heredity and how characteristics were transferred down over the generations. I visited it in 1981 at the height of the Cold War, I took this photograph of his garden. Actually, it was quite a big garden. It wasn't used for growing things to eat. It was used for growing his plants for his experiments. And next door to it was a greenhouse, unfortunately dismantled, of similar size. I mean, frankly, there was major investment from the Augustinian monastery in scientific research. 
quite extraordinary, in the 1860s. And from that research, um, he came up with the laws of genetics. And he did that, and he was successful where many others had failed, for several reasons. He did trial crosses with a range of plants and decided only to work on those which he could make sense of. You could say that he was cheating in some ways. But actually, in biology, which is so complex, you have to choose material and problems that you can solve. Remember, science is the art of the soluble, and it's no point wandering around if you can make no sense of it. And he ended up choosing the P, and he uh, chose the P because it was easy to characterize the, the uh, different traits of the plants. I'll show you some um, in a moment. And because he was a physicist, he counted what he saw. He was quantitative. So you can see here some of the different characteristics here. We have um, flowers of different colors. We have tall plants, short plants. We have seeds which are not shown here, which are um, rough or smooth. Now, because he worked on peas and these different characteristics, the differences were decided um, by single genes. It became easy for him to analyze. What they produced were the very simple ratios that you may have read about in school, like three to one, one to one, um, nine, three, three to one. And what you need to take home from that is simply that he could explain it all if what was the basis of this were particles, particles that were being segregated during the, um, during the crosses that he was carrying out. These particles, um, a, a particular model for inheritance of what we'd know as genes today. Interestingly, nobody took a blind bit of notice of what he published. It lay there for 35 years, and then it was discovered by three um, geneticists um, at roughly the same time who got the same results. They weren't always so generous in acknowledging their predecessor, and there's a story around that, but I'm not going to um, sully science by telling you about it. All you have to conclude is that they're human beings just like we are today, and we're not perfect. Um, then it was taken very seriously. Why? We don't really know, but several things happened between 1865 and 1900, 1902. The first is that chromosomes were discovered. This is a late 19th century picture of um, uh, chromosomes in onion root tip cells, which is where I first saw cells when I was at school in northwest London did a squash and saw these, these chromosomes here. And um, these chromosomes were postulated to be um, the place where uh, genes were located, which were being separated every time a cell underwent um, division. Then, of course, that led subsequently to uh, the idea, in fact, the fact that these chromosomes and genes were made of um, nucleic acid, DNA, that was um, discovered by Avery, working in the Rockefeller Institute in um, New York, which I led for eight years, some years ago, actually. Um, and that showed that um, DNA um, was the, um, the chemical basis of heredity. Did a beautiful experiment. Um, took a DNA from a pneumococcus, a bacterium, um, of, a no of a virulent strain, basically dropped it on a non-virulent strain, and transferred virulence from one to the other. And it was DNA that contained that, and that's what showed it was um, um, DNA was the hereditary material. And then, of course, what we see here is the double helix, the famous double helix structure involving um, Crick and Watson based on the experiments of, um, of, of, of Franklin um, and, and others, um, like Wilkins. And um, we know, and I shall refer to it again a bit later, that this is the basis of her heredity. And finally, Crick himself um, postulated um, a, what he called the central dogma of molecular biology, where the information, which I shall talk about more, stored in DNA is uh, transcribed into another nucleic acid, RNA, and then translated into protein. And that's going to form a central part of what I shall say. 
This is the basis of Schrodinger's code script. It explains the permanence of, the, of uh, heredity because it's replicated every time a cell and therefore an organism divides. So living organisms, and now we have to think about principles, um, are based, at least on Earth, on nucleic acids. Nucleic acids and encode information and they can be precisely copied because of pairing between um, bases that make them up. And again, I shall say a little more about it. Before we do that, though, this discussion has introduced two new concepts that I want to um, introduce to you. The first is chemistry. Uh, the chemical aspects of living organisms are critical for understanding life, life as chemistry. The second concept is the importance of information encoded in those molecules. And these are the two ideas I'm going to discuss next. And I'm going to start with life as chemistry. Basically, life is based on chemistry and physics. It's the mechanistic basis of life. I have to stress that because for many years, actually a couple of thousand years, um, starting with Aristotle, um, scientists thought that the complexity of life was so great that it could not be explained by the laws of chemistry and physics. They proposed vitalism, that there were vital laws that weren't based on chemistry and physics um, that were necessary to explain that complexity. It took work by French chemists to overturn this. Initially, Lavoisier, although his work was terminated because he was guillotined, because unfortunately, as well as being a scientist, he was a tax collector for the ancient regime. So he lost his head. And then it was taken over by Pasteur, the famous Louis Pasteur, who was working on an applied project on why sugar beet fermentation went wrong, came to the conclusion that it was all to do with chemical products being made during fermentation, and came to the following conclusion, that fermentation was a physiological act yielding chemical products for the cell. And he could then advise the sugar beet fermenters um, as to how to do it. And then he made a general conclusion. Chemical reactions are an expression of the life of the cell. In other words, he was postulating if we want to understand life, we have to understand the chemistry that goes on in life. I can summarize that in a different way which is that living cells, back to cells again, can be considered as a chemical machine, a complex chemical machine, um, including also physical processes as well. However, it is a very special sort of chemistry that we see in living cells. Um, on this planet, this chemistry is based on carbon. Carbon is made inside stars. Um, it's the 14th most common element in the universe. We are basically based on stars. Sort of rather interesting um, idea. Now, what's important is that each carbon atom can form four chemical bonds, linking it to other atoms. And it can use two of those bonds to link to other carbon atoms to make up chains, a sort of polymer. You can see that here as a backbone of carbon um, that uh, makes up um, a, a, um, a, a linear polymer. But then it has two free bonds, which can um, form uh, uh, bonds with other uh, atoms, um, such as oxygen, hydrogen, carbon itself. Um, and this means that there's a variety of different chemistries that can be put on top of this basic polypeptide chain. And that's because it's made of um, a, 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 a chain of amino acids, which are of carbon and connected by nitrogen. And the, there's 20 different amino acids that are used by life, and they have different chemical characteristics. Some of them are bulky, some of them are small, some of them are acidic, some of them are basic, that is, they have negative or positive charges. Some of them like water, some of them don't like water. And all of this can lead to a wide variety of chemical properties. 
And because you can build up extremely long carbon chains, maybe, uh, I mean, thousands of, uh, 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 um, thousands long, then you can produce very complex structures which can also fold up into a three-dimensional structure. Now, there's a lot going on here that is really important to emphasize because what we have see here, starting off with a simple carbon polymer made up of different amino acids, you can make elaborate molecular structures with a variety of different chemistries that can be put there that leads to a huge variety of chemical machines. And these are the basic workhorse of life. These make up the enzymes that change other chemicals into different chemicals. They can build up molecules. They can break down molecules. That's uh, as part of metabolism, um, which uh, is critical for the functioning of life. And these chemical machines are so efficient that they can operate in very gentle conditions. We sometimes try and mimic it in rather more extreme conditions, in, for example, industrial chemical plants, where we have high temperatures and high pressures and, uh, um, and extreme conditions. But these can operate in very gentle conditions. Why is that important? It's important because it means that within a cell, a tiny cell, many hundreds, in fact thousands, of chemical reactions can be occurring um, in a very restricted space because you're not having to have high temperatures or pressures. You can have very gentle conditions. However, these uh, um, reactions can only occur if there's different chemical um, microenvironments. So um, if we look at a metabolic map here, each of those dots on this map, I had to learn this as an undergraduate, that's why I, I took all the names off. But um, all these dots are different chemical reactions, and they're all occurring simultaneously in the tiny structure of the cell. And if you now look at a cell, uh, you'll see it's extremely complex. Um, but what I want to uh, try and convince you is that actually this complexity represents the micro compartments of different chemistries that are occurring on in the cells. It's not how it's normally explained. And that's brought about by the proteins themselves with different folds making little compartments where di uh, certain chemistry can go on, assembly of those enzymes, which result in um, uh, components being passed and molecules being passed from one enzyme to another, different membrane components, uh, compartments, as you see here in this cell, and even different colloidal structures, what we now call phase separations. So when you look at the complexity of the cell, I want you to imagine it as many hundreds, in fact thousands, of little chemical microenvironments carrying out specific chemical reactions adjacent to each other, connected to each other, but separate. And that is needed to generate the chemical complexity of life. Now, there's a consequence of this, is that this intricate spatial organization of the cell, of these different chemistries, um, must be able to communicate across the cell. Because if they're not communicating with each other, you can't get order. So you need compartmentation and separation, but you need also communication. What contributes to that, um, and that comes from physics, is that there is a skeleton within the cell made up of different, um, like tramway rays or railway tracks, connecting different parts of the cell. And there's little motors working their way through the cell, transporting different components from one place of the cell to other places in the cell. And all of these um, need energy, and in fact, to maintain the cell needs energy. And there's little batteries in the cell as well, like our chemical batteries. Charged hydrogen atoms can accumulate behind some of these membranes and act as batteries. They're transferred through the membrane, um, the protons, the charged um, uh, um, atoms, and uh, that produces high-energy chemical bombs, which are stored for um, uh, use elsewhere. Communication, then, is critical. And communication between all these components is dependent upon information 
and the transfer of information. And that's my next great idea in biology that I want to explain to you as the basis of life. And that is that biological entities are complex systems and that information management is crucial to understanding um, how they work. It won't surprise you um, that this idea has grown a lot of prominence in the age of computing because obviously information and the management of information is critical in computing. And so there was much discussion of this from the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s onwards. But it may surprise you to learn that the idea that life is a complex system with these properties has its origins with the philosopher Kant, Immanuel Kant, around 1800. Um, I found this a big surprise. He wrote a book um, on, um, on moral philosophy and for some reason got completely distracted into talking about the complexity of life um, in talking about moral um, philosophy. Um, in fact, although biology can be described in terms of chemistry, as I've just done, it often only makes sense biologically when that description is translated into the management of information. That sounds a bit abstract, but it's important that you get this for understanding life. And there's two examples I want to use to illustrate that and why it's important. And the first is to go back to DNA. Now, I've already explained that DNA is um, made of DNA, of course, but is um, the uh, hereditary material. It encodes information. Implicit in Mendel, by the way, was information. Schrodinger used the word code script, but it only made sense um, back in 1865 if you saw it that way. Now, the double helix of DNA, and you see it here being copied, and because of the uh, it, uh, DNA is like a, uh, a ladder of, of bases. There's four different bases, and G, base G will bind with base C, and base A will bind with base T, so that if you pull that apart, you can get a perfect copy. It's a beautiful thing. And I want you to note that those bases are all on the inside of the polymer. That's sort of protected there. And that's going to be important in a moment. Now, as I said, we can describe it as I just did in terms of chemistry. But it makes sense biologically when you recognize that actually it's a digital information storage device. I mean, that's what we're looking at here, a digital information storage um, a, a, a device. Now, there's more to it than just that, because it's organized as a linear script. Now, we often, nearly always, um, order information as linear scripts. Think of reading a sentence. It's a linear script. Think of listening to me talk to you. They are linear scripts. Think of computer code. It's a linear script. Think of a polymer. It's a linear script. It is no accident that life is built on a polymer because it is the perfect way of storing information, which is critical for biology. It's critical for information storage. Also, as I explained, it gets better because the linear DNA molecule is very stable because the backbone is on the outside and is not chemically reactive. The chemical reactive parts are on the inside and are protected one with another. So it's a very stable way of storing that information. However, it can't do anything because it's so stable. It cannot do anything. But remember the central dogma. You go from DNA to RNA and then you go to protein. And remember what I said about protein, and I'm going to just show you the same slides again. Now, you still have a polymer. It still reflects information. Each of those amino acids, what you put in there and the order is determined by the base sequence in the DNA. But now everything is facing outwards, and all the chemistry is facing the environment. So you have oxygen, you have nitrogen, you have positive charge, negative charge, much less stable but now it can carry out chemical reactions. So what you do is you are turning um, stored information in nucleic acid 
into chemical actions in protein which are needed um, for life. So you have a storage device which is stable and you have a protein um, which are um, reactive and carry out the chemistry of life. This is really fundamental in understanding life because you can solve the problem of information storage and you can solve the problem also of chemical action. Second example relevant for information and making sense of biology and in information is seen with gene regulation. This was shown by Jacob and Mono, um, who I knew, or at least I knew Jacob quite well. Um, and they did it by doing beautiful genetics with bacteria, looking at sugar metabolism in bacteria. And what they did by abstract genetics is discovered um, negative feedback control. What is negative feedback control? Well, this is a governor from a steam engine. Now, you may be like me. I sort of understand most machines built before 1900 <laughs> and almost nothing built after 1900. I took a picture of this in New Zealand, actually. It was in a steamship, um, and I went down and photographed it because it was such a beautiful thing. It was found on, uh, originally on James Watts' steam engines, and we understand it. The spindle rotates. The balls are thrown out. They lift a valve, and that closes steam off from going into the engine, so it slows down. Then the balls go back in again, and they let steam back into it, and it speeds up. And this is essentially homeostatics. It's maintaining a certain, in this particular case, rotation of the um, particular um, spindle. And what uh, Jacques Mono did was to use this principle to describe regulation. And here we're looking at um, something, in fact, not to do with gene regulation, but it's the same principle um, as what they uh, described, where we have a chemical A turned into chemical B turned into chemical C. There's enzymes, which are the green arrow. And as C accumulates, it switches off the enzyme that um, is catalyzing A into B. And therefore, you inhibit making B, you inhibit making C, and then C drops in level, you lose the inhibition, up comes the enzyme between A and B, and you go back again. And what this is doing is maintaining, by negative feedback, a constant source of material. If we look at the bottom one, we have positive feedback loop, which is the complete opposite. When you accumulate C, it switches on the enzyme, going from A to B. So once you've started this, it turns into a switch, and you cannot go back. You get the principle... And life's metabolism and gene regulation is built on these simple pr principles of this type of feedback control. Now, you can put them together in all sorts of complicated ways. And a metaphor is an electronic circuit that you see here. And these circuits, which we find in life, can produce uh, negative and positive feedback, switches, timers, toggles, oscillators, all of which are playing a role in life. Now, it's rather special, just like the chemistry is special, this is special. Because when we think of, for example, um, computing, which is, of course, the same principle, you have hardware and software, yes? The hardware can't change. The software, you can make the hardware um, uh, operate in different ways, but the hardware is wired in. In biology, it's cleverer. It was uh, used, the term was used by Dennis Bray, he is a systems biologist. He used the word wetware rather than hardware because the communication between the different regulatory steps is carried out by molecules diffusing through water. And this means you can rewire the hardware by directing the chemicals to go to different places. So not only can you reprogram it through if you like changes in software, you can also change it through changes in hardware. We do not yet begin to understand this complexity, but it's, in, it's important. Now, networks can be very complex. We see at the top here how we like to think about things, or to be more precise, um, how men like to think about um, things, <laughs> which is linear pathways going from A to Z. But the truth is, in biology, it's much more complex. And 
Whereas we all intuitively understand what's happening at the top there, we don't at the bottom. It's just too, too difficult. That is because of the next idea I shall talk about that, um, uh, of evolution by natural selection simply means that you add things on to something and make it just more complex. Not necessarily the simplest way to do something, but simply a way of actually, um, um, a way of actually doing it. But I want to mention one more thing that we don't often think about in these pathways, that if we introduce dynamics into a pathway, that is, changes in time, it becomes much richer. And uh, this is a simple example of it. We have a single, at the bottom there, pathway, and now we're pulsing information down, and either frequently or infrequently, and the output can be different, depending on the oscillation, the frequency. This has already been seen. Why am I stressing this? Well, I'll tell you why. Here we see a metaphor for it. Can you see the traffic light? If it's a simple on-off signal, it's either green or red. Not a lot of information. If you introduce dynamics, you can produce the Morse code, because you're, you're pulsing information. And now you can write the works of Shakespeare. Now, I'm not suggesting the cell is writing the works of Shakespeare, but I am suggesting that we haven't got to beginning to the bottom of how this is all operating in cells. They are absolutely um, extraordinary and are the basis of how living things work. So what I've explained to you is that the way it's working is through chemistry plus physics and then management of information. And that's key to understanding what life is. Now, my final idea. I can't stop it. This is the most beautiful idea in biology. Evolution by natural selection. It's got two aspects. Life evolves, and a major mechanism of it is natural selection. It's a beautiful idea, um, which we mostly associate with Charles Darwin, who you see on the right. Um, but actually, the idea of evolution, that is, of living organisms changing over time um, was not Charles' idea. It had been talked about for a century before um, by um, a French scientists like, like um, uh, Lamarck, for example, but also Erasmus Darwin, who's shown there on the left, who was his grandfather of Charles. Now, Erasmus is a rather entertaining character, so I'm just going to entertain you with one or two things about Erasmus. He, um, he was a poet, and he published most of his science in blank verse. <laughs> I have a number, I collect um, books from this time, and I have a number of, uh, of books published in the late 18th century, and it's all written there in poetry, uh, with, a, with actually a very interesting science there as well. He was a doctor. Um, George III asked him to be his physician more than once but he was a Republican and wouldn't do it. <laughs> he was in favour of female education, and he set up a girls' school um, and wrote a book on how women should be taught. It was the first female school in, uh, in the UK, so I'm told. And he got into trouble um, with his um, local dean. He lived in Litchfield for some of his life, in the cathedral close, and he had on his um, coach the motto, everything from shells. What, what did that mean? If you open up a shell, you see, you see a, a, a sort of formless blob in it, yeah? And what he was arguing is all life came from formless blobs. But the dean didn't like it very much and um, told his richer patients that they shouldn't go to this... Um, a rather eccentric doctor. And because he actually only charged rich patients, he didn't charge poor patients, he had to paint it out. Anyway, very interesting character. And he um, wrote um, a number of verses about life changing, evolution. But he had no mechanism. And that was led to his grandson, Charles, over there, who gathered enormous evidence, first of all, the fact that, uh, on, based on fossil evidence that there had been evolution, and secondly, 
um, during his voyage on the Beagle. And secondly, that he proposed a mechanism. And the mechanism was natural selection. And it goes a bit like this. Um, actually, completely like this. I don't mean a bit like this. <laughs> Within a species, um, there are variants. They, they have differences. These are due to inheritable differences. They're not ones where if you grow a plant in the sun or not in the sun. They are inherited differences. Those variants, genetically inherited ones, which are most successful, reproduce more, therefore pass on more genes to the next population in the next generation. And therefore, there is selection for changes in characters. And over time, that will lead to speciation and therefore evolution. And it also accounts for why you can get exquisite uh, adaptions. And that we see here. He studied these finches in the Galapagos and came to the conclusion that they were beautifully adapted to whether they fed uh, on insects or broke nuts. And I put up there a series of tools which are also perfectly adapted for what they do. So, two things. He argued that there was evolution, so all life was related. This is the one figure in the origin of species, related by descent. And secondly, there is um, beautiful adaption. And the reason why this is controversial is because um, it can lead to apparently purposeful behaviours. And if you have purposeful behaviour, normally it's easier to describe that because somebody's made it. And there's the famous story of the Reverend um, William Paley finding a watch on the path. And when he saw the watch, he said this had to be created. And it, when you see animals and plants perfectly adapted, he argued, therefore they had to be created. But what Darwin's um, idea of natural selection showed is that you could evolve by natural selection apparently purpose, without having to postulate a creator. It would come naturally from that. Now, how can it actually occur? Well, it occurs because life reproduces. It has a hereditary system based on genes, which determine what life is like. And it has variability upon which natural selection can work. And there I've turned this into single cells. And what you see here is a cell, I hope it's visible behind me, um, which starts being orange and ends up being um, red, at least on the right-hand side. Do you see that? Okay. The idea is this, that you have genes, they're replicated, you pick up um, an alteration, what we'd call a mutation, and that leads to um, the coat of the cell being red rather than orange. And red cells have a reproductive advantage so over time, you replace the orange population with a red one, okay? So that's a simple evolution by natural selection. And what we have here is everything you need to evolve. You have, and that's seen in cells. You have genes of the hereditary system. They show variation because they're not copied completely precisely or they're damaged by external um, uh, for, uh, uh, x-rays or sunlight. And then that can lead to um, evolution by natural selection. I want to finish this part with a quote. This is the old Charles Darwin, the one that we um, um, tend to think of. And it's, a it's the last sentence of the origin of species, because he wanted to show that he could produce laws in biology, just like Newton could do it in physics. And he states, whilst this planet has been gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, obviously reflecting Newton. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. It's a beautiful ending to a book. I wish I could write like that. But if I did, it would be edited out as being um, <laughs> pompous or, or not entirely relevant. I get it all the time, of course. <laughs> Um, now, I've told you about some ideas which are relevant, and I'm about to do a, a sort of synthesis of them um, to sum up. But before I do that, 
I just want to make one or two comments about some life forms which are difficult to know whether they're alive or not alive. Of course, there's no simple answers here, but viruses are the critical one. This is a bacteriophage, which is a virus that lives inside bacteria, but we have viruses in uh, us as well. Now, viruses have a nucleic acid genome. It can be based on DNA or RNA. Both work. And they contain, that genome, genes encoding components of the virus. They undergo evolution by natural selection. We see that with, for example, how the flu virus changes all the time, every generation. So they're undergoing evolution by um, uh, natural uh, selection, um, which you could argue is a very important principle for defining life. It was one that was actually proposed by Hermann Muller. Um, he was a, 19, uh, uh, a geneticist in the mid um, 19, uh, uh, 20th century because he defined life as living things have properties which allow them to undergo natural selection and therefore to evolve. He simply took Darwin's idea and turned it into a sort of um, a, 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 a principle. Oh, I should have said, Darwin wasn't the first person to think of uh, natural selection. Should have said that. It was published in 1831 by um, a man called Matthews who was writing a book about ships' timbers and how to grow it. It was only one side, so it was nothing like Darwin, but he did have the, um, um, he did have the uh, 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 principle. And he wrote to Darwin after Origin of Species and said, you might be interested in reading this. And Darwin, in the second edition, actually acknowledged this. And, of course, the story of him also, um, Alfred uh, Wallace, who had the same idea when in a malarial fever, is well known. Back to viruses. Viruses evolve by natural selection, so they pass, if you like, the Muller test. But they can only reproduce themselves where they're, when they're in the side, the cells of other living things. They're completely dependent upon it. And they do so by hijacking the cell's molecular machinery to copy the virus's genome and to copy and to make the components that encase that virus. So this means a virus cannot operate separately from another uh, living being, its host. It's completely dependent upon another living um, entity. So is it truly alive or isn't it? Well, it's not a clear, there's no clear answer about this, but I want to say something that generally isn't discussed in thinking about this. It's important to remember that other life forms are also, to greater or lesser extent, often dependent on other living things. It's not just viruses that have such a dependency. We have many parasites that live inside the cells of bodies or animals or plants or fungi, which are living and depending upon them. This dependency is less total than it is for a virus, but it's in the same direction. Even our cells, we cannot make all the chemicals we need. We get them from some other living organisms. We can't make certain amino acids efficiently. We have to eat them, and we eat them um, from plants and animals that actually do make them. So we are also not entirely independent of other living organisms. Even free-living microbes are dependent on uh, molecules made by other living organisms. Bacteria, fungi, and so on, um, require glucose, ammonia, generally made from other living organisms, particularly plants, which use the energy of the sun to make biomolecules from simple chemicals, including from the carbon dioxide in the air or nitrogen, which is in turn actually made by bacteria found in the roots of certain plants. What I'm trying to stress here, um, and as I said, it's not normally sort of recognised, what we really have is a graded spectrum of living organisms from viruses, which are obviously utterly dependent, um, through to plants, which are almost completely independent and a wide range in before. In the case of the virus, the dependency is strong. In other, it's weak. But they all share attributes of life. And where you want to draw the line is up to you. And it depends really on your psychology. Are you in your taxonomy? Do you like splitting things up 
or do you like putting them together? I like putting them together and saying they're all life, but some require other life forms to fully operate. But actually, all life on the earth is fundamentally connected. Um, it's also fundamentally related as a result of evolution. There is a great interdependency of all living forms on our planet. Now, I'm going to finish with principles. And I'm going to describe six principles which I think are important for thinking about life. The first one is simply really a description. I've discussed all of these things before. Um, it's just really to try and put it together. Living organisms have these properties. They maintain themselves. They grow. They can organize themselves. They are exquisite at doing that, self-organization. They can reproduce, make precise copies of themselves. They have heredity, and they're highly diverse. This is what we have to explain. These are the attributes of life. Secondly, life, and this is critical, this is the Muller statement, life evolves by natural selection through reproduction, heredity, and the variability of the heredity um, system. Now, by doing this, they acquire purpose. They are entities that can build and maintain themselves, and they have these attributes that allows them to actually do that, and therefore to evolve. But it's the way purposeful behavior can arise without having to invoke a creator. So it's critical. The third one, the cell is the basic unit of life, separate from the environment, but in communication with the environment. This is clearly required to cope with the second law of thermodynamics, and you have a bounded entity that can make complex, um, uh, uh, a complex entity to uh, uh, produce the things that you see on, on that slide. Principle four. Life is based on carbon poly polymer chemistry. We have lipid membranes built on carbon that separates the cells. Hereditary material built on carbon polymers that makes DNA, makes RNA. We have enzymes built on protein carbon polymers, which easily um, uh, give rise to chemical um, reactions. So polymer chemistry can give rise to complex chemical reactions, whilst um, nucleic acids um, store information in linear chains of um, DNA bases. Integrating all these functions together um, is uh, uh, needed. And what a living organism does is to gather informational inputs from within itself and from outside itself, processes them, stores them, uses it to instruct the cells to behave in particular ways. All of this is generated by polymer um, chemistry. And I don't need to repeat it, but the beauty of it, the stable chemical structure of nucleic acid, chemically inactive, beautiful for storing information, so easily translated into the chemically reactive um, proteins that we see there in living things. Final point, life is related um, and to everything else on the planet, and it's highly interconnected and we are dependent to varying extents upon all other life forms on the planet. We are all part of an um, ecosystem. I didn't put it up here, but just to stress, all life has to use energy to organize itself. That energy ultimately comes mostly from the sun through light and photosynthesis, generating high energy compounds, but it can also come from heat, from geothermal sources, where there's life forms that depend upon that. So this is what I want you to think about in principles underlying life. But I want to end with something a little bit more almost philosophical. Um, I think the principles we've talked about here are likely to be found in other life forms, should they exist, on um, in somewhere else in the universe. I think in particularly important is polymers because of the way it connects information to chemical reactions. And I think that's something that we, is, is really quite profound if you 
think about it. But if we, go to, if we consider our planet, it is, of course, the only corner of the universe where we know for certain, at the moment at least, that life exists. And we know, as I started, that it is extraordinary. It's extraordinarily diverse, and we can make sense of it. And making sense of it, by the way, is fun, it, it's, it's, it's rather central to our culture and our civilization. I mean, we have to know it. I mean, it's important to us. We know that we're related to the rest of life on the planet. We also know we're deeply connected to the rest of life on the planet. As far as we are aware, we are the only life forms on this planet who can see this deep connectivity and reflect on what it means. I would also argue we have a particular responsibility because of all of this for life on this planet. It's made up of our relatives, some of them quite distant, but they are all in some sense our relatives. And um, it, we are interconnected with it. I want to leave you with this thought. We need to care about life. We need to care about it, and we need to care for it. And to do that, we need to understand it. And I hope you understand it a bit better at the end of this talk than at the beginning. Thank you very much. Hi all, welcome to Sky for the Month for July 2021. Of course, brought to you by Victorian Lockdown 5.0. Looking at the highlights for the uh, next month, July and August 2021, you notice there's a bit of activity uh, with respect to comets. Uh, there'll be a little bit more about it later in this presentation, but uh, Needless to say, there's, uh, there's quite a few there to have a look at. Uh, the moon is at perigee on the 21st or the 7th, and full moon on the 24th. So it, uh, it's going to be quite bright, not really going to help uh, with the comet viewing. We don't see a last quarter moon until the, uh, the end of the month, and uh, early next month, the 2nd or the 8th, Saturn will be at opposition, which is uh, an excellent time to observe. Uh, the second largest planet in our system. We uh, have a new moon on the 8th of, the, uh, of August and Jupiter in opposition on the 19th of August. As I said, there's a couple of uh, comets uh, featured. Comet Finley uh, in Taurus. You've got Pons Winnicky still, although I believe it's starting to fade. You've got Comet Dearest and Comet Tuttle is near mentioned next month and uh, it's not actually included in this month's comets but uh, next month we'll speak more about it. Looking at the sky for uh, July, looking towards the South Celestial Pole. And a couple of things uh, worth noting. Uh, in particular, you have uh, good viewing for both Amiga Centauri and 47 Takana. Now Amiga Centauri is uh, just a, a bub to the right of uh, Crux or the Southern Cross with uh, 47 Takana uh, down towards uh, the opposite direction if you follow uh, the tail uh, of Crux, the other side of the South Pole there. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter uh, this month uh, are in a better position for viewing with Saturn in uh, Capricorn, up there on the top right, and behind it in Aquarius is Jupiter. Now, both planets are fairly easy to find uh, once you know exactly where to look. In addition to that, you've got the uh, globular clusters there, uh, M4 right next to Antares, the red brightest star in Scorpio, so it makes it fairly easy to find. And down towards the top of the lid of the teapot, uh, for Sagittarius there, you've got M22. 
Now, it may be a little bit difficult to see, given the fact that it's uh, up there in galactic centre, or with the galactic uh, centre of the galaxy behind it there. There is uh, quite a bit of uh, stuff to look at in that area. Also got the uh, Triffid Nebula there. It's uh, another good one to, uh, to spot. Looking at the July 21 sky uh, to the towards the northern horizon there. Got a couple more uh, globular clusters to look at. We've got M15 to the lower right there near Delphinus. Uh, moving to the left you've got M13 in Hercules and a little further to the left you've got M3 uh, in Booties near uh, Coma Venetis there. Also uh, something worth noting on this chart here, uh, a couple of little circles with arrows emanating from them up there to the right. The Alpha Capricornids and the Delta Acreorids. These are both meteor showers that uh, occur during uh, this month and I'll speak a little bit more about them uh, later in the presentation. Looking at what the planets are up to this month, uh, Mercury reached maximum elongation west on the 5th of the 7th. Essentially elongation west meant it was a, a morning object uh, to be viewed before sunrise. Uh, it's now moving into superior conjunction which is behind the sun, uh, obviously in conjunction with it but on the far side. This occurs in early August and then uh, later in the month it will actually return to the evening sky, fairly low on the horizon. Uh, on the 19th of the 8th, it'll be 0.2 degrees from Mars. Now, Mars is uh, very low on the horizon now, so a little bit questionable as to whether you'll be able to see much, but uh, 0.2 degrees is fairly close. Uh, Venus, for those who uh, have been able to see a western evening sky in the last few days, will note there is a very bright star up there. Uh, that is the planet Venus as it moves towards its maximum elongation east. The elongation east meaning it is an evening object and it will be fairly high in the sky for, a, for quite a while yet. Very easy to spot due to its brightness. Uh, it will get higher and uh, stay up a little later in the evening. Uh, Earth uh, was at Aphelion on the 6th of the 7th. Uh, it's now moving closer to the sun as it progresses around its orbit. So hopefully things warm up a little bit. Looking now at the outer planets, uh, Mars is fairly low on the western uh, horizon uh, as it moves towards its conjunction with the Sun. You won't see a lot of detail on it, not a very big planet, it's a fair way away. It will be the last uh, chance to catch it in the evening uh, for quite a while. Jupiter is now rising in the evening sky uh, at a time that's fairly respectable for most of us to uh, have a look at. It is in Aquarius and it will reach its opposition next month. Uh, opposition is generally the best time to view a lot of these uh, planets because it is when they're actually closest to Earth. Uh, when you're looking at Jupiter, you may be looking for its uh, bands, its great red spot, and certainly observing the configuration in particular of its four uh, Galileo moons. Uh, Saturn is also now an evening object. It uh, rises ahead of Jupiter now and is in Capricorn. Uh, it reaches opposition next month as well on the 2nd of the 8th. Its uh, rings are still tilted towards uh, as to reasonably good viewing. Of note is uh, the rings now only about 17 degrees of angle. Uh, over the next few years these uh, rings will close until uh, Earth passes through the ring plane in March 2025. Now this is a phenomenon that happens every 15 years uh, apparently and for those who uh, know a little bit about Saturn you'll know that's about halfway through its uh, orbit and if I was doing this to a packed audience I would actually uh, provide a little demonstration to help explain it for uh, particularly the newer members. Uranus still in Aries, going to be there for quite a while. Uh, it's now a morning sky object, rising about 2 a.m. in the middle of the month. And Neptune rises around 10 p.m. 
uh, in the eastern sky in Aquarius. As for the appearance of the planets, uh, Mercury at its greatest elongation west, it still appears as a crescent, and that's because the maximum elongation occurs when it's still slightly this side of the sun, so we are looking at the uh, shaded backside. As it moves around, moving closer or heading in towards its superior conjunction, it will show more face to us, but as you can see, it shrinks in size. Venus, on the other hand, uh, is still coming around. It is approaching its uh, maximum elongation, so it is still just past the sun to us, so we see a lot more face of Venus. Mars, uh, really just a small red dot, not a lot of detail uh, can be seen. Uh, Saturn, those uh, rings still tilted towards us, looking uh, at it from the top, and as I said, uh, that will still be the case until they close, or Earth passes through the ring plane in 2025. Jupiter, uh, always spectacular, uh, in opposition, so it's as big as it'll uh, get. A uh, good time to observe those, particularly those surface details, and if you've got a big enough telescope, the uh, red spot. Uranus, uh, reasonable diameter now, but it is a morning object, and uh, we need to be fairly keen to uh, catch it. Neptune, now all I've ever seen of Neptune is a blue dot, even through reasonable sized telescopes. Just gives you an idea of just how far Neptune is away. As for the other stuff this month, uh, as I said, there's quite a, a few objects uh, worth having a look at or looking out for. Uh, starting with the comets, Comet Pons Winnicky has been with us for a little while now. It rises early in the evening and pretty well visible throughout the night. Uh, it's visible in the sculptor, moving into Phoenix, uh, but it is expected to fade from 8th magnitude to 10th magnitude. So uh, it is on the way uh, back out to the outer reaches of the solar system. Comet Diarest, uh, visible in the evening sky in Hercules, so northern hemisphere for northern uh, viewing. Moving into Serpens, uh, it's actually expected to brighten to 10th magnitude. Comet Finley uh, reached perihelion, basically means it's as close as it's going to get to us uh, on the 13th of the 7th, and uh, it's a morning object in Aries, moving into Taurus. It is likely to peak at 10th magnitude, so as you can see, these uh, are not particularly bright objects. There was another one mentioned uh, for August, Comet Tuttle, I'll talk about that one next month. Meteor showers, we have two meteor showers occurring uh, at the moment. We have the southern delta of Quirids occurring from the 12th of uh, July to the 23rd of August. So, no real rush. Hopefully these clouds will clear and we'll be able to get out there and uh, check a few out. The delta of Quirids are fairly, uh, are much fainter meteors, uh, reaching their maximum uh, on the 29th and 30th of this month. Unfortunately, we also have a full moon at that time, so it's not going to help uh, with their viewing. The Alpha Capricornids are uh, bright, slow meteors with long paths and frequent fireballs from dusk to dawn. Uh, they'll be visible from the 3rd of the 7th to the 15th of the 8th, peaking around the 30th. Uh, there's not a lot of these. They generally uh, at their maximum, apparently around about 5 per hour, but uh, certainly the fact they're big, slow fireball ones, I reckon they're the ones to look for. And that concludes Sky for the Month for July 2021. As I said, brought to you from Victoria Lockdown 5.0. And uh, as usual, tonight's information was provided by Astronomy 2021 by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Thank you for listening. I hope to see you all next month in person. So, after that uh, interesting talk, uh, now on to some um, other topics, uh, sort of uh, related to uh, the subject of how the Moon was formed, and uh, hence uh, how the Earth was formed in its earliest stages. 
leading on then of course to um, how did uh, life uh, come about and uh, actually form life so I hope you enjoy some of these uh, subjects and, and topics and uh, do feel free to uh, request any that uh, interest you for uh, future meetings. Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It's been 50 years since Neil Armstrong famously stepped off the footpad of an Apollo lunar lander and onto a new celestial body for the first time in human history. And once he was safely standing on the surface of the moon, he spoke perhaps some of the most famous words of all time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But something about this always confused me. I mean, sure, the step off of the lunar lander's 91 centimeter foot pad was a nice, easy, and small step. But the step just before that was actually enormous. I'm talking about this. The huge gap between the last rung of the ladder and the ground. I mean, why on the moon is that gap so huge? Isn't it dangerous to require an astronaut to jump down onto the surface and then have to jump back up? The lunar lander's ladder had nine rungs, all spaced out at 22.8 centimeters apart from each other. But the gap between the last rung and the ground was about three times that, at a whopping 76 centimeters. So really, the ladder wasn't missing one rung, it was missing two. I mean, sure, the gravity's only one-sixth that of Earth's, but wouldn't it have been so much safer if there was even just one more rung that closed that gap up just a little? So today we're going to look into why NASA and the Lunar Lander's manufacturer, Grumman, chose a ladder of this length. We'll then talk about all the design considerations of the hardware, the unknown conditions of the lunar surface itself, and the astronauts who were basically just too smooth the pilots to get the ladder's last rung any closer to the surface of the moon. Let's get started. Three, two, one, and On May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy announced his goal of putting humans on the moon by the end of the decade to Congress. At the time of this historic and ambitious announcement, the U.S. had exactly 15 minutes and 22 seconds of human spaceflight experience with just one suborbital launch under their belt. By the way, I should probably mention that Kennedy's speech in front of Congress is not the famous we choose to go to the moon speech. That happened over a year later at Rice Stadium in Houston. But the point is, this insanely ambitious goal almost immediately put a lot of things in motion. A tsunami of engineering ensued. I mean, so much so, sometimes it feels like the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. One item that almost immediately began development was the lunar lander itself. In July 1962, 11 companies were asked to submit proposals for a lunar lander. Grumman won the contract and began to design mock-ups as early as 1963. Wait, what's all this have to do with a ladder? Well, hold up, I'm setting up a story here, and to me these stories are half the fun, these little fun nuggets of history. But this particular bit of history is one of the key reasons why the ladder is the wrong length. Grumman was building a lander intended to land on a surface that we knew literally nothing about. This is understandable when the only data we had at the time was from the orbiters taking footage from the Ranger missions, and before that we just had ground-based telescopes here on Earth. Well, I guess actually Ranger 6 through 9 actually recorded footage all the way up until impact, resulting in some footage with an impressive resolution of 0.3 meters. But we still had almost no idea of what the surface of the moon was actually like. It wouldn't be until June 2nd, 1966 before the US would soft land Surveyor 1 on the moon, some four months after the Soviet Union landed Luna 9. This would be the first time there'd be any data available to the US about the composition of the moon's surface. And even so, it was quite limited. This means during the first three years of development of the lunar lander, there were countless question marks. Many scientists thought the surface might be so soft and powdery, it might swallow a spacecraft or people entirely on the surface, sinking them so deep they wouldn't be able to get out. 
While NASA was busy sending spacecraft after spacecraft to observe the moon, Grumman was deep in development of the lunar lander. The first couple years saw a lot of changes, including things like going from five legs to four legs, from a round cockpit to more of a polyhedral shape, and even going from a round hatch to a square hatch. Oh, by the way, that round hatch led to astronauts really struggling to get back into the spacecraft, so Grumman switched to a square version to help make egress and ingress that much easier. This is also around the same time that Grumman was playing around with using a rope instead of a ladder, which astronauts found to actually be impossible, and despite them using a Peter Pan pulley system which would simulate 1-6 gravity. So Grumman opted for a ladder down the front leg of the lunar lander. But even with something as simple as a ladder, weight was an enormous factor. I mean, after all, for each kilogram landed on the surface of the moon, it takes about 400 kilograms of rocket to launch from Earth. This means Grumman went to great lengths to cut weight, including ditching seats and using lightweight golden cap ton foil for insulation, but it also means the latter, like all things, needed to be extremely lightweight. For example, I think my favorite thing to think about is how if the lunar lander were standing on its own legs here on Earth, it would have likely collapsed under its own weight because those legs weren't meant for Earth's gravity. They were only designed to handle the moon's weaker gravity. And the same thing goes for the ladder. If you were to try to ascend the ladder, the actual ladder here on Earth, it would have likely broken because it's not meant to handle Earth's gravity. So they made it as lightweight as possible and only capable of handling one-sixth gravity. But weight likely isn't the main reason why the ladder stops short of the surface. For this, we need to look at the landing gear the ladder is affixed to. The landing gear were designed to absorb the energy of impact and keep the LEM from toppling over. Grumman engineers were incredibly concerned with the LEM tipping over, so a significant amount of work went into the design of the landing gear. The landing gear was so vital that after the command module and the lunar excursion module undocked, the command module pilot was instructed to visually inspect all four legs to make sure they were properly deployed from their stowed position. A leg that wasn't properly locked in place would have been an immediate abort, but fortunately, none of them failed to deploy. One interesting design consideration was the invention of a single-use shock absorber. NASA and Grumman developed a crushable honeycomb aluminum cartridge, otherwise known as a crush core. There was a great concern about using hydraulics in the landing gear in fear that they could leak and leave a landing leg unusable. So, for simplicity's sake, they went with the crush core, which is basically just a set of cartridges made of aluminum that either compress or stretch to provide smooth and reliable resistance. This technology is still used today for certain applications. Actually, SpaceX has crush core in the landing struts of their Falcon 9 rockets. If the hydraulic shock absorbers bottom out, they have additional travel in the single-use crush core. This was very obvious on TICOM 8, which launched and landed on May 27, 2016. The booster had a little bit of a rough landing, resulting in one of the landing legs eating into the crush core, which made the booster stand lopsided. By some miracle, the booster made it all the way back home, despite some really, really close calls. But back to the lunar lander. Its legs could absorb a large amount of impact velocity, and due to their crush core absorbers, they did not rebound like a traditional hydraulic absorber. They just compressed and then they stayed in that position. They were designed to handle up to three meters per second of vertical velocity with zero horizontal velocity or up to 2.1 meters per second with 1.2 meters per second of horizontal velocity, which they could handle very reliably. Now, since NASA didn't know how much the shock absorbers would stroke or compress, and they were unsure of how deep into the lunar surface the LEM might sink, they didn't want the ladder attached to the movable part of the strut and potentially hinder any movement. As a matter of fact, NASA assumed the struts would travel a lot more than they did. Come to find out, two factors prevented them from actually traveling that much. The pilot's skills and the surface of the moon's ability to absorb energy. That's right. The pilots were, in a sense, maybe too gentle with the LEM, and they all landed so stinking softly, there was hardly any perceivable travel on the legs. But then again, there were so many unknown variables, NASA was playing this whole thing extremely safe. The astronauts were instructed to cut the engine when one of three 1.5 meter long lunar surface sensing probes made contact with the surface. You've probably heard them make that contact call out. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 
This was intended to not only help prevent the engine from kicking up too much debris and dust for visibility and hull puncture concerns, but it's also because the engine had engine thrust decay. This is where even after successful shutdown of the engine, there's still some residual pressure that can last anywhere from half a second to a few seconds. All rocket engines have this. Fun side note, this little bit of extra thrust decay went unnoticed on the test stand when SpaceX upgraded their Merlin engine between flights two and three of their Falcon 1 rocket. After stage separation, additional thrust decay led to a collision of the first and second stage, causing a loss of the vehicle. The Apollo commanders were intended to cut the engine at 1.5 meters in altitude, which would have been the right height to touch down at a safe velocity and compress the legs enough based on what NASA thought would be an adequate amount. But despite all this, all six landings had very different actual impact velocities. Neil Armstrong gave Apollo 11 the softest touchdown with a vertical velocity of 0.54 meters per second. Apollo 17 was the next softest at 0.91 meters per second. Apollo 14 was next at 0.94 meters per second. Then Apollo 12 at one meter per second. Apollo 16 at 1.7 meters per second. And lastly, Apollo 15's commander David Scott finally gave her the beans at 2.07 meters per second, but that's still well within the operational range of the legs. And now a big concern was having the descent engine coming in contact with the lunar surface. And despite Apollo 15 carrying the additional mass of the lunar rover vehicle, having a 25 centimeter nozzle extension on the descent engine, landing on the steepest lunar slope of 11 degrees, and despite the nozzle actually buckling, the nozzle still didn't actually come in contact with the surface at all. The buckling of the nozzle was due to a buildup of pressure from firing the nozzle so close to the surface and not from coming in contact with the surface itself. But another factor that was later accounted for on why the struts didn't compress that much was the fact that due to the moon's somewhat powdery surface, the surface itself would actually absorb around 80% of the impact velocity. And this is perhaps why the landing legs compressed so much less than they had planned, leaving the final rung higher than nominal. Okay, so basically the moral of the story is landing on the moon was a big fat question mark with the Apollo program. NASA took the most conservative approach to as many things as possible, including fail-proof shock absorbers, additional thermal protection on the landing legs, big fat landing pads, and contact probes to name a few. Suffice to say, they didn't want to make the ladder any longer than necessary and potentially hinder movement of the landing gear. So assuming things went as planned and the shock absorbers went deep enough, the ladder would have been a nice and easy step. But all this said, the final step still worried some astronauts. The commanders were actually trained to immediately attempt to jump back up to the bottom rung after initial descent down the ladder. This way, the pilot who is still inside the LEM could assist if there's any struggle to make that large gap. Neil actually commented on this before he stepped off the lander's pad. Okay, I just checked uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's uh, that doesn't collapse too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. Roger, we copy. It's a pretty good little jump. Different astronauts had different experiences with the ladder, such as Jim Irwin saying the ladder was a real struggle, and 170 centimeter tall Pete Conrad saying, Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. So to summarize, the final rung height was a topic for much debate, but with all the unknown variables, a bounty out there for every single kilogram to be shaved from the vehicle, and figuring jumping up and down in 1-6 gravity would make ascent and descent much easier, they also didn't know how much the lunar surface would absorb energy, so NASA left the bottom rung at its final gap of 76 centimeters from the bottom of the ladder to the top of the landing pad. Or maybe NASA could have just done what the Soviet Union planned to do with their LK lunar lander and just used a hinged ladder. The tilt of our planet's rotational axis is about 23 degrees currently. And it's that tilt that gives us our overall seasonal pattern. It turns out that if we didn't have our moon, or if we had a moon but it was just smaller than our current moon, that interactions with the other planets in the solar system 
would cause Earth's rotational axis to vary by many tens of degrees on time scales of millions of years. This would have profound impact uh, on the overall climate of the Earth. And while the Earth, with such a wildly changing tilt, might still have been habitable, it would certainly have been an entirely different climate and a different Earth than we have today. And so in this way, the formation of our moon and the formation of our moon, of just the mass of our moon, has had a very important impact on the evolution of the Earth's spin state and with it, the evolution of our long-term climate. There's a fundamental connection between our studies of the origin of the moon and the physical samples that were brought back by the Apollo mission, the actual rocks from the moon. When those rocks were first studied, we learned several uh, very significant things. One, we learned that compositionally, those rocks are extraordinarily similar to the upper layers of the Earth. If you look at an element like oxygen, its distribution of different isotopes of oxygen is essentially identical in the Moon and the Earth, whereas it's very different in meteorites from Mars or the asteroid belt. Another clue, another constraint we learned from the Apollo samples is that the moon rocks appeared very dry compared to Earth rocks, almost as if they had been heated to a high temperature and that they had lost the elements that tend to vaporize easily upon heating. And that suggested to us that the process that formed the moon must have been a high energy event. So we think the moon formed when the Earth uh, was struck by a very large object as the Earth was forming. So this would have been a separately formed planet that was vying for dominance in the inner solar system along with the Earth and other growing planets. But it collided with the Earth and ultimately was absorbed by the Earth and gave birth to our moon. So in terms of the impactor, which we often call Theia. We think that based on its mass, that it would have been as big as the planet Mars. Before it collided with the Earth, it would have had an iron core and a silicate mantle like the Earth. And it would have had about 10% of the mass of the Earth. We think initially the inner solar system had maybe 20 small planets. And it was through collisions between these planets that we eventually ended up with our final four terrestrial planets. Now the last of these big collisions on the Earth was the one we think formed the Moon. The reason that we focus on a Mars size impactor is that that is the impactor size that if you hit the Earth with a Mars size impactor at an off-center angle at uh, the expected speed, you will start the Earth spinning with about a five hour day. Now that's a very rapid spin rate, but it turns out that is what is needed uh, to agree with our current 24 hour day with the moon at its current distance. The moon is moving away from the Earth. So we know when the moon first formed, it was much closer to the Earth and the Earth was spinning much faster. So the idea that the moon formed by this giant collision with the Earth was first proposed in the mid-70s. And yet, we couldn't test the idea initially. For smaller scale collisions, you can perform experiments in the laboratory, but you can't perform an experiment of what happens when two planets collide in any laboratory setting. To do this, you need to build a computational model to simulate the planets and their response to the collision. We can use our computer simulations as, in essence, a virtual laboratory to test how the outcome depends on things like the size of the impactor, the impact speed and angle, and use the overall results to assess the likelihood of forming a moon like ours. So we're simulating this final large collision with the Earth. From the perspective of someone on the Earth at the time, 
what you would have seen is an enormous object approaching the Earth, many, many, many times larger than the full moon in the sky. It would have hit the Earth at an oblique angle. On a time scale of a few hours, an enormous shock wave from the impact would have propagated around the entire surface of the Earth. The vaporized rock from the initial uh, impact point would have been ejected out and it would have flowed around the entire Earth. And the Earth would find itself enveloped by a thick atmosphere, but not like an atmosphere we know today. This would have been an atmosphere of vaporized rock with a temperature of more than 5,000 degrees. The momentum, the force of this collision, is enough to start the Earth rotating very rapidly. And so only hours after this impact, the Earth has a rapid rotation rate. Now we think on a much longer time scale of about 100 years, that disk will cool, the vapor will condense, and out of that disk, through collisions within the disk, the moon would have grown and accumulated. So although we think we have a good idea about how the moon formed, uh, the exact details of this event are still being debated, and this is in large part a testament to how those samples that were returned decades ago are still driving active science debate as ongoing analysis provides us with more clues from those samples on how the Earth-Moon system formed. As primeval man watched the moon in the night sky, it became to him an object of curiosity. In legend, he tells the story of an old man who, while digging, discovered a small shiny object. As he held it in his hands, it grew and grew, and finally escaped into the sky to become Moon. This is the moon that saw life begin on Earth millions of years ago.
stones from across the night. By making ourselves very small, perhaps we will see what these rocks have seen and remember back those billions of years. Over decades now, geochemists have been measuring lunar samples and Earth samples and found that the chemical signatures of the two are identical in a very special way and that the elemental isotopes of the two bodies are identical. so many things about the moon, but it has a huge flaw. It predicts that the moon is mostly made from the Mars-sized planet, that the Earth and the moon are made from different materials. But that's not what we see. The Earth and the moon are actually like identical twins. The genetic code of planets is written in the isotopes of the elements. The Earth and Moon have identical isotopes. That means that the Earth and Moon are made from the same materials.
What do you do when faced with the unknown? Question everything. We were making the mistake of thinking that a planet was always going to look like a planet. The giant impact was making something completely new. from the impact vaporizes the surface, the water, the atmosphere, and mixes all of the gases together in just a few hours. The Earth would have been like Jupiter. There's nothing to stand on. A synestia gives us a new way to solve the problem of the origin of the moon. The moon grew from magma rain that condensed out of the rock vapor. The moon could have orbited inside the Synestia for years, hidden from view, revealed by the Synestia cooling and shrinking inside of its orbit. Synestia turns into Earth only after cooling for hundreds of years longer. The Moon's special connection to Earth is because the Moon formed inside the Earth when Earth was a Synestia. Synestias have been created throughout the universe. We only just realize that by finding them in our imagination. What else am I missing? What is hidden from my view by my own assumptions?
Cool. All right. So, yeah, um, this is Sarah Stewart here at UC Davis. Uh, What's your title here and how long have you been here? I'm a professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. I've been here almost five years. Well, first one is just how would you describe a synestia? What is a synestia? And maybe from that, what is the origin of the idea for a synestia? It took us a long time to figure out what a synestia was. We stumbled upon it by looking at what happened to planets when they got really hot, because they get really big. And normally we think of planets as having a spheroidal shape and rotating all together. And we were finding these bodies that didn't look like that. Hmm. And what we learned is that you can actually make a planet too hot so that it breaks all the rules of being a planet and it becomes a new astronomical object. And we named it a synestia. So, and the shape of a synestia, I've heard it described as a big, like, jelly donut kind of, is that, you know, kind of, kind of accurate? I mean, when you see the shape, it gives you a sense of it, but... So, a synestia is basically a rotating ball of gas, but it's not a sphere like the Earth. It has a technical term, it's mm-hmm. called a biconcave disk, mm. which is what a red blood cell looks like. Oh, perfect. In our simulations after a giant impact, the shape looks like a puffy donut with an iron core in the middle, and so the press called it the space donut. The space donut, beautiful. <laughs> Leave it to the press, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, the name of synesthesia is really interesting. A lot of people keep getting it confused with synesthesia. Um, what, where did the name come from? Like, So planets are named after Greek gods and goddesses, and so we decided to stick with that tradition. And so synestias are named after Hestia, the Greek goddess of the hearth and home. Mm. And we picked it just because it was something warm and the the earth, so home. Mm. And we used syn as the prefix because the object is all connected from the core all the way out to the farthest gas. And we wanted to emphasize that connection, so we called it synestia. Gotcha. Go into the like process of of finding this. So most discoveries nowadays in in formation seem to be simulation driven. Can you go into that a little bit? Like, what are we simulating here? And what variables go into it? So we, the discovery of synestias was a really convoluted process. (laughs) There was no straight path. We didn't know what we were going to end up with. All we knew was we were trying to understand how to make the moon. So if the moon forms from a giant impact, the giant impact traditionally makes a planet surrounded by a disk. And what we do is take computer simulations of the giant impact and then try and break it apart into two pieces, a disk around a planet. And what we found was that we couldn't do that in a way that was robust after very high energy giant impacts. And it looked like the planet and the disk were connected in a way that hadn't been found in earlier studies. Hmm. And so the rules that we were applying to break it into pieces weren't working. And then we were stuck because we didn't know what the right answer was. And we got unstuck by asking a basic question again, which was, what is a planet and how do we define a planet? And when do we have a planet and a disk, and when we have something else. And so by going back in and saying, when can a body rotate altogether, and when does it break that rule, and become hot and large enough that the outer parts actually rotate like a disk, that's when we finally figured out what a synestia gotcha. is. Gotcha. And that kind of goes into the co-rotation limit a little bit, right? So outside the co-rotation yeah. limit is that disk-like. Is that right? And then so, inside is... When you think of it that way, as a planet, it's a body that can rotate all together. Mm. When you reach the limit of that, we call that the co-rotation limit for a planet. And if you exceed that limit, you become this new object, okay. the synestia. Okay. Yeah. And is, it, is it inside the co-rotation limit? Is it basically just viscous forces and like, like fluid forces, really, that it's keeping it together? Uh, and outside that is orbit. It's an orbit, essentially. Or- when you... Uh, when a planet can rotate all together, mm. the structure of the planet, sort of the pressure with distance or the density with distance, mm. is determined by gravity and mm. hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Okay. When a body exceeds that limit, there's now a large rotational term, and there's no way that the body can rotate all together and have 
a pressure profile that's physical. Okay. So what happens is the outer part has to rotate more slowly in order to maintain a normal pressure gradient. Okay. Okay. What what are where are the error bars? Like where where are there big areas that still need to be looked into I, before we started recording? You said that there was still a lot of uncertainty, but so the discovery of synestias and the fact that a synestia is a new type of astronomical object is absolutely robust. Mm. I have no question that this is a real thing in nature. Yeah. Uh, where the uncertainty lies is how do you make a moon inside yeah. a synestia? And we're just at the tip of the iceberg in trying to understand that. Okay. So we published an initial study to try and understand how a synestia cools. And it cools by radiation leading to the formation of magma rain that falls inwards and those rain droplets can collect into a moon that orbits inside the synestia mm. and grows. And because it's orbiting inside the synestia, it should have the chemical characteristics of the thing that is growing inside. And so that is our explanation for why the moon has such a chemical bond with the earth. And in particular, there's a specific measurement that uh, confuses everyone, which are the isotopes. Every element has different weight nuclei, and those are called the isotopes of the different elements. And the Earth and the Moon are almost isotopic twins. Mm. And previous models for moon formation actually predicted that they wouldn't be twins. Hmm. And so we propose that the reason why the Moon's isotopes are the same as Earth is because the Moon formed inside the Earth when the Earth was a synestia. Yeah, so I guess the next thing about accretion modeling, that's, that's still really where the big problem is. So the next step is to link a physical model of growing the moon in the synestia and cooling the synestia. And it's a coupled problem, but the fluid dynamics of it is hard. <laughs> and there's no off-the-shelf code that can solve that problem today, and so it requires development. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it, you said a minute ago that uh, it was it was it's clear that it is a new astrophysical object. Is it? Are synestias generally accepted now as a as you know almost not superseding the giant impact hypothesis, but like a, a really like a leading hypothesis? So synestia or, idea for yeah. the origin of the moon is is new. Mm -hmm. It's got people's attention. Mm. There are com Competing ideas in that people are trying to change the previous models in order to make them explain the observations, and mm -hmm. that's still a work in progress. Okay. I'm quite optimistic that it will lead to something interesting, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but the details of exactly what, which synestias could make a moon that's like our moon is not solved. Okay, gotcha. Oh yeah, this is just a small technical thing. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out, trying to like sort of nail down what was the spin rate after impact? Um, like, do we, what are the range of hour long days? Like, right. I've heard from two to five. Yes. It's, it's two to five. <laughs> Somewhere so, between there. So, currently the moon is moving away from the Earth because of tides. Right. And as the moon moves away, the Earth's rotation slows down to conserve angular momentum. And if you go back in time to where the moon formed, mm. the Earth would have a five-hour day. Five hours, okay. okay. But other things could have happened mm. to change the length of Earth's day. And if they did, then Earth could have been spinning faster. And it's actually easier to put more mass farther out in the disk if the Earth were spinning faster, which would help explain our large moon. Mm. And so a high angular momentum giant impact can help make a very extended disk and a very hot disk and perhaps solve another problem related to the orbit of the moon, which is the inclination of the moon. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Okay, that's a perfect lead in because the next question, I mean, I, I'm definitely going to go to Matia about yeah, this, yes. but um, uh, the inclination of the moon is a weird thing because it's only five degrees off the ecliptic, but uh, can you... Maybe can you give just a little overview about Laplace uh, plane transition, and then I think we'll be kind of out of time. <laughs> I'll explain the the, the, the general idea. problem, okay. right? So, if the moon formed in a disk around Earth's equator, we would expect that the moon's orbit would have no inclination, and even though uh, the moon has moved outward in time, there are other dynamical processes that would keep it in Earth's equator. Mm -hmm. 
what we see is the moon's orbit is inclined by about five degrees and it turns out that's really hard to explain <laughs> and so if a giant impact tilted earth over so that it had a high obliquity compared to the ecliptic of the solar system the moon would have formed in that tilted equator later as the moon moves outward the reference frame transitions from being the Earth's equator to being the plane of the Sun, and that's called the Laplace plane transition. And when that happens, there's an interaction between the three bodies that changes the tilt of the Earth, so it's less, has a less, a smaller angle mm. compared to the plane of the solar system, and that leaves the Moon in a high inclination orbit. So we published a model that says that the reason why the Moon's orbit is inclined is because it actually used to be more inclined in the past and it's just not gone all the way to zero gotcha okay. yeah. wow <laughs> it's a complicated problem <laughs> it is a very strange yeah. dynamical situation <sighs> in that it's odd and requires a special explanation mm. it's not something you would expect to happen naturally okay yeah okay interesting and we haven't seen that that inclination issue anywhere else in the solar system have we or uh, I don't know that there's evidence of a Laplace plane transition. You'd have okay. to see, you have to talk to Matia about that. Okay. <laughs> see other <laughs> dynamical things, and we see that the tilts of planets have changed. Mm. And that can lead to mm. tilting the orbit of moons. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. I'll definitely ask him about mm. that. I mean, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is how much of the, uh, like, the Gadget 2 uh, simulation for the Synestia. Um, this was like a 2D cross section type of simulate. Like, was this a full 3D SPH? Yeah, SPH is usually calculated in full 3D. Okay. And especially when we're. A giant impact is a 3D event, mm. right? There's no plane of symmetry that lets you flip and mirror what's going on. Uh, right. Only if there were a head on impact could you do that. Right. None of them are head on impacts. Okay. And so they are full 3D models. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, how long did the the sim sims take? I mean, like just physically, hardware wise. So on uh, 2012 computers, they would take about a month okay. high resolution, and now we can do ten times more particles, and it still takes about a month. Amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. That's pretty much the limit for how long you want to wait. Are we up to a hundred million particles? Uh, a billion? No, no hundred million that's people don't do. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> million is is possible. Okay. Uh, you have to be patient. Most people okay. don't run all their simulations at a million. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Um, yeah, any burning thoughts about Sinestia? If you, if you were going to talk to somebody specifically. Right. So astronomers are looking for Sinestias around other stars. Mm. They would be big enough and bright enough to detect, just like we can detect exoplanets. Mm. You just have to find a young star that had a giant impact not very long ago because Sinestias don't live very long, mm. only hundreds of years. But because we have observatories looking for planets around nearby stars, like the TESS mission, they are in place to find a Synestia uh, by accident. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> I'm excited for that. Wow. Awesome. Cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. You're and welcome. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely be sending you this when it's all done, okay. all of the various mediums. <laughs> all right. I've always thought if we could somehow just see the germs around us, everyone would be a lot more careful and we'd get sick way less. Unfortunately, that's still not possible. So I did the next best thing by running a day long experiment in this third grade classroom. I found this powder called glow germ and just like real germs, when it's on your hands, you can't see it. But unlike real germs, if you turn a black light on, it becomes visible, but it transfers to things you've touched. So it provides a really good way to visualize exactly how germs spread. So before the kids arrived as a control I went around and noted any pre-existing spots in the room that fluoresced under the black light and then it was go time. The kids of course had no idea what we were doing and that the teacher had been secretly infected with the glowing powder. So she randomly shook the hands of three kids but didn't touch any of the rest. And so with that, they just went about their normal day.
At break, I did choose one random student and he agreed to let me put some of the powder on his hands too. And then two hours later at lunchtime, I checked the results. Remember, everything you see here started with just the teacher and one student having a little of that powder on their hands. And because my flashlight can only illuminate one spot at a time, I use Photoshop to better visualize our observations of where germs were left behind, including on the other kids. Uh oh, they're pretty hot over here. Oh, right here. And they were actually pretty diligent about washing their hands. This was the desk of the kid that was infected. And what's crazy is that germs could live on a hard surface like this for up to nine days. And so you can see how important it is to disinfect the things a sick person regularly touches. For example, this was the phone of the teacher in the experiment. Even if you wash your hands really often, if you immediately pull out your phone, a lot of those germs just go right back on your hands. Think about when the last time was that you cleaned your phone. My friend Joanne at the Wall Street Journal recently demonstrated you can clean your phone with an antibacterial wipe every day for at least a year and it doesn't affect the oleophobic coating at all. And this hopefully gives you a better mental model of why it's really important to wash your hands or use hand sanitizer after being at places like this or this or this or this. Cleaning commonly touched surfaces is important because even if a virus is spread through airborne transmission, those tiny droplets don't stay in the air for long. Then they land on surfaces waiting to be touched by our hands. Which raises an important point. The ultimate defense against catching a virus is just don't touch your face. Your eyes, nose, and mouth are like the single weak spot on the Death Star when it comes to viruses. That's the only way they can get in to infect you. But as you can see here, not touching your face is easier said than done. And before you think, yeah, well that's just kids for you, this was what the teacher's face looked like at the end of the day, and she said she tried extra hard to remember not to touch her face. I found this result fascinating, so I put the powder on my own hands for a few hours, and I resisted the urge to touch my face so many times that I fully expected I was going to have a perfectly clean face and the moral high ground. And then this is what I saw. <laughs> What the heck? I genuinely have no idea when any of this came on. Until I reviewed the footage. Oh, well, there you go. On average, we touch our face 16 times an hour, which is why washing hands is so important. It's impossible to catch a virus directly through your hands. It's as futile as shooting the outer surface of the Death Star. The problem is we use our hands to help the virus out by constantly giving it a ride to our figurative Death Star exhaust ports. Because of this, I ran another experiment with some of the kids after lunch. First, I had them put some lotion on their hands that also glows under a black light. But then I told them I made a mistake and used the wrong lotion. Can you guys just wash, go wash your hands real quick. Now do a good washing, right? Yeah, do the right washing, okay? I just tricked you guys again. Because what I really wanted to do is test how good you are at washing your hands. So guess what I'm gonna do now? Show me your hands. But before I show you how effective they actually were at washing their hands, here's what you should quickly know about viruses. They're super tiny, but also the most abundant biological entity on the planet. In fact, there's over 10 million viruses in any single drop of seawater. And a lot of types of viruses are beneficial to the planet's ecosystem, and only an insanely tiny percentage affect humans at all. And they're really simple. Viruses are basically a shell with some DNA inside, and they just want to spread and duplicate. That's their only goal. But they're so simple that they need a host to do that. So they reproduce by infecting their host cells and then trick them to become factories that just make more exact copies of the virus. When you get sick and then cough or sneeze or wipe your nose and then touch a surface, you're putting copies of this virus out to find other hosts and just repeat the process. And so here's what the kids' hands look like after washing their hands. Uh-oh, look at the backs. Let me see your fingernails. Oh, look at all those germs. Oh, your thumb. Oh, my hand. Oh, look at your wrist. Look at your wrist. We all sort of have a habitual way of washing our hands. So once again, I tried this myself using the typical quick way I do it in my muscle memory. Granted, that's better than nothing, but you can see the difference compared to when I was deliberate and took 20 seconds. Which is why it helps to do things like sing the happy birthday song twice, or you could do what I do and follow Brandon Flowers' example. Jealousy turning saints to eager eyes Cause I'm Mr. Brightside 
And then for a final experiment, I wanted to show how dumb handshaking is, so I infected the first kid with the powder and then had them do a handshake chain down the line. The fifth person here still had significant traces on their hand, so I put him at the first and lined four more kids up after him and three of their hands glowed. So we got trace germs from the original person all the way down eight handshakes later. So if you ever meet me in real life, please don't be offended if in lieu of a handshake I offer you a fist bump and a selfie. Now to close uh, tonight's meeting, we have a, a video um, uh, released by uh, Dr. Brianna Pobener of um, the Smithsonian Institution in the USA. And this looks at uh, the fossil record of uh, evolution from the first stages of life uh, in the very early earth, right up to uh, the current timeline. And one of the first things that will immediately impact you as you um, uh, look at this video is that um, uh, for huge amounts of time uh, not very much uh, actually occurred and then all of a sudden took off and um, uh, the background music to this is um, coincidentally also called evolution by uh, bensound.com and is uh, used with uh, the uh, the permission um, hope you enjoy <laughs>